Hey, welcome everyone to this episode of Keto Chat. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I've got Dr. Guillermo Ruiz here. Welcome, welcome. How's it going? Um, oh my gosh. Yay. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm going to say oh my gosh a thousand times because I have been searching for uh, a not only, you know, just keto friendly functional medicine doctor. And I've been searching high and high and wide, far and wide. Um, all over the internet and asking for other referrals. And I, I found one uh, to refer my client to somewhere, I don't remember, somewhere in the Midwest. And they had some uh, like concierge package and it was going to cost her like five or th five or six thousand dollars just to work with this, this doctor. And I was like, ah, I don't know, hold off, hold off. I don't think you need that extensive of, of, of stuff. And I just happened to ask Tyler Cartwright of Keto Gains one day because I was looking for somebody for myself. And it turns out that here we've got Dr. Ruiz that not only it works virtually, but he's in my backyard here in the Arizona area. So welcome, oh. Dr. Ruiz. That was a very long-winded uh yeah, no, you know, we, we, here, we need but... to go. Uh, uh, we we need to go out for dinner, you know. And uh, I, I yeah, to go to, uh, uh, you know, a couple of places that are very keto friendly. And listen, I'm a Texan, you know. I I was born in Texas and. Man, the barbecue out here, you know, puts it to, you know, it puts it on notice. Okay. I think, I, I think you recommended one place to me and I've, I've been to a different one, but yeah. And I've been to Texas a couple of times and you're right. The barbecue there, like, mm, nobody. I yeah, know. And listen, just wait. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's, it's really cool because um, when I started, you know, uh, with naturopathic medicine, um, when I, when I wanted to become a doctor, you know, I wanted, I didn't want people that you could tell, Hey, you know what? Let's go gluten-free. You know, it, it's like, what? Yeah. it's so simple. And, and people are so much more sophisticated than that. So in reality, I was looking for those tough cases. You know, I know mm. we have a mutual friend, you know, uh, people like Rob Wolf, people like Chris Kresser. And that's who I was interested in, you know, like the people that mm -hmm. are doing an ancestral lifestyle are changing their, their habits mm -hmm. and then things don't change. You know, it's the classic, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, my husband, you know, uh, stopped drinking beer and he lost 20 pounds. I yeah. haven't looked at a car in three years and I gained two, you know, it's yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's, that's who, you know. I, that's where I geek out. That's where I, you know, ah, that's the type of patient that I like. Oh, cool. Well, you're so, I'm so excited to have you on our team, start referring people to you. And uh, um, I, I can see we've got some people watching live, so I can't see who you are unless you comment. So go ahead and post a comment here. Let me know you're here. Um, if you've got any questions for Dr. Reese, either already queued up in your mind or as we're talking here, go ahead and type them in the the chat box there and we'll make sure we get to all the questions as well too so just to give a little more background i'm going to read a little bit of your uh i give you more an official introduction here but uh dr ruiz is a, a graduate of medical uh is a graduate medical student from the southwest college of naturopathic medicine and his aim is to use research to advance naturopathic medicine using an evidence-based approach and focuses on finding evolutionary connections between our modern and traditional healthcare systems. Um, he uh, practices endocrinology in Scottsdale, Arizona, and uh, at, at Go Health. That's the at Go one. Health, yes. Uh, specializes in metabolic optimization. So I've got a. We'll we'll talk about what is metabolic optimization, <laughs> which is actually really cool. Um, his hobbies are kind of boring, I gotta say. Research, learning, and practicing what he's doing. So, no, that's awesome. Um, and uh, he sits on the board of uh, uh, several boards, uh, directors for ancestral and evolutionary diet and lifestyle, um, as well as uh, supplement companies. And so, hopefully, you can know why I'm so excited to have him here and have discovered him. Uh, he's my personal naturopath now, and we're working on some stuff uh, that's cropped up for me. So, anyways, so glad to have you here. Um, how did you, so you said you're from, you grew up in Texas. How did you get interested in, uh, becoming a doctor? You know, it's a funny one. You know, I've always wanted to be a doctor, you know, it's like okay. uh, they had a Fisher prize, you know, plastic stethoscope and, you know, the yellow okay. thing, blue thing, you know, I always knew that I wanted to be a doctor. 
um, grew up in Mexico, lived in Mexico 14 years, and then uh, moved to Texas, did my freshman year in Texas, and then we moved to Florida. And okay. I lived in Florida, uh, you know, I'm a graduate of uh, the uh, University of Central Florida in Orlando. And, and you know, it, it took me a while to find my path, you know, always in the back of my head, you know, I want to be a doctor. Around 2010, okay, um, I, I was struggling with weight. Uh, and, I've, you know, I've been a vegan, I've been vegetarian, I've done... Atkins, South Beach, you know, the, the whole gamut, you know, and eventually I got a, I got a book, it, my friend uh, uh, loaned me a book called Good Calorie, Bad Calorie. Okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Like, uh, that was my, that was my first hit, you know, and of course you start reading all the research on how wrong we've gotten things. And, you know, there's a lot of um, things that have been uh, kind of like debunked, you know, mm. with you know, I, I, you know, since 2010 until now, and our understanding of, of ketogenic diets has changed so much. Mm -hmm. It's gone from like, oh, we get to eat bacon with lard, you know, uh, to a more refined approach to mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and science doesn't deal in paradox. Um, around that time, my, uh, uh, my uh, significant daughter's mom passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was a very rare form of cancer that starts with a gluten allergy. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know, there's like uh, some studies, you know, it's so rare that the, the few people that actually get it, you know, they get studied. And there was a study where, you know, three sisters got it. It's a, it's a jejunal cancer in the first part of the small intestine. Mm. And, you know, the first one died, and then the, sec the, the other two were diagnosed with celiac disease. And it was early enough where they were able to reverse the disease process. Oh, know? good. So I've been, you know, geeking out, you know, on that in, in how grains affect gut health. You know, and, mm. and sure enough, you know, health starts in the gut. At the time, I was working in a level one trauma center for kids in uh, Arnold Palmer. Uh, uh, and, and all of the doctors at the hospital were like, no, you don't want to go into medicine. You're going to be miserable, blah, blah, blah. And in the back of my head, that five-year-old kid was like, no, you're going to be a doctor, you know? So I've been listening to, uh, to the paleo solution back in the day, you know, and oh uh, yeah, with Rob Wolf. Okay. Rob Wolf ever since, you know, and, and, and one time, you know, he had Chris Grasser on, on the show and he said the word nature bad. And I was like, What's that? You know, so I started investigating, and 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 I always want to be the type of doctor that you know we could do like lifestyle modifications, mm. such as diet diet uh, diet changes, supplements. You know, who doesn't take supplements? You know, uh, and but if I needed to prescribe a you know a, a, an actual prescription, you know, doing a prescription, doing um, uh, you know, ordering labs and. Mm -hmm. things like that and it's so ha it just so happens that naturopathic medicine is that you know it gives me mm -hmm. a very broad scope of practice so i like to say that naturopathic medicine found me not okay. the other way around okay and, and and yeah and so i you know hauled my ass all the way to arizona and here i am you know loving just loving what i do mm -hmm. so will you um Will you clarify for people, because there's going to be some people watching that don't understand the difference between a naturopathic doctor and a medical doctor, and they also think that, like, well, a naturopath's not a real doctor. So will you clear that up? <laughs> well, you know, the first thing that we need to clear up is that I don't like the term alternative medicine. Mm. You know, medicine, it's mm. either medicine or not. There's no alternative to health in how we reach health it's going to depend on whoever is in front of me, you know. Um, in Arizona, I have full scope. I, I am a licensed uh, naturopathic medical doctor. I have a DEA number. I have an NPI number. I can prescribe. I can diagnose. You know, I, I am afforded all of those tools. And then my scope is cool because my scope basically covers anything that is natural. Hmm. What was that? So, so like, imagine, you know, it's like I can prescribe a supplement. I can prescribe 
uh, bioidentical hormones. I can I can prescribe all of these things that happen organically. Plus, I have a pretty extensive um, ability to write prescriptions and order labs and everything that comes with it. You know, so it's it's pretty it's a pretty cool. You know, probably the best hidden. Um, uh, profession, you know, the best, best hidden secret in, in, in healthcare. Yeah. And on top of that, I can do, um, IV uh, infusions, you know, so mm. uh, people that need a little bit of immune support, or if you have iron deficiency anemia, we can do mm. iron infusions and, you know, uh, all of these different cool tricks. And I'm not limited by two things. I'm not limited by Hey, you know, uh, you, you, what's the nutrition? You know, you, you're not a nutritionist. You know, well, no, that's a natural. Uh, you know, that's a natural uh, treatment, and I am able to prescribe diets. And on top of that, I can also do um, uh, all of these cool IVs and all of these cool um, supplements, and have the pharmacology when needed. And and I try to use the most effective and most um, economical i guess you know way to achieve health okay well and and uh where i got all my nutrition training and my psychology training was a uh comparable naturopathic school up in the seattle area you you went to school down in scottsdale is that where uh it's tempe tempe oh, okay okay um yeah so uh I always looked at, and I had uh, experiences myself with, you know, traditional medical care from MDs and then going to see my first naturopath. And the the whole process was just so enlightening, right? Whereas a normal doctor will spend, normal, regular doctor will spend, you know, five or seven minutes with you. Whereas a naturopath, your first appointment typically 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah. And, um, you know, after spending more time at the school and just understanding that, uh, that basically you go through the full same medical training that a medical doctor would do. And on top of that, you learn supplements and nutrition. Uh, and here in Arizona, I, I learn uh, acupuncture, I, I um, manipulation, you know, so. Yeah. And, and that's a big, that's a big thing. You know, I think my friends in the hospital and listen, you know, uh, uh, emergency medicine is amazing, you know, um, and, we need and, that. We need that. <laughs> we need that. It, it, uh, for example, you know, uh, my niece, uh, she had an ear infection and it progressed to mastoiditis, you know, which mm. is an inflammation, you know, uh, an infection of the mastoid bone. And she had to have emergency brain surgery. Oh, I, that, I, I can't do that. You right. know, it's like, uh, and I think that the, the, the dislike of, not wanting to be a doctor is because you get these cases you get uh for example you know i i was proxy to diagnosing nine-year-olds with diabetes mm. you know, uh you know they would come in with a um with a uti with a urinary tract mm. infection and uh we would run their glucose on on the on the peace strip and and their glucose would be through the roof and, mm. and you're peeing all this glucose bacteria take advantage of that they get a hold and they start reproducing and uh and then you give them an antibiotic and then you say you know go to your primary and try to fix it you know yeah so then they go to their primary and they have a five minute visit mm -hmm. you know, they they only have basically one choice you know just to prescribe something right you know? Because I am outside of the insurance model, I get to determine what my value is mm -hmm. and I get to put a fair value for my time. And I get mm -hmm. to spend an hour with you and giving you all of the different you know, paths that we, can, that we can follow to achieve true health. Mm -hmm. So in the conventional model of medicine, yeah, I bet it would be so frustrating you have a mom coming in on a Friday afternoon with a kid with an ear infection and they're like, listen, I need an antibiotic because if my kid doesn't get better, I can't go to work. And we understand that antibiotics don't work against viruses and we are trained, our friends in the, in the conventional model of medicine know this, but they're, you know, between a rock and a hard place. So 
switching and taking advantage and being a being fully responsible and advocate for your own health allows you to go outside of that cookie cutter model and go into a deeper type of you know preventative care yeah absolutely yeah i think that um some of my clients are struggling with understanding like well i've got medical coverage i've got a doctor already why would i why would i need this other guy to help me i understand but what would you say about the big difference between like somebody who's got insurance that covers routine medical care and you know why would they want to pay out of pocket for somebody that for another doctor yeah well i, I think that uh the the system is broken you know and, mm. and if you've read you know books like uh chris Kresser's um conventional uh health uh or if you know it's it's the same as saying you know um you know i've been eating uh waffles for breakfast okay. or cereal for breakfast and then you know a sandwich for lunch and a salad for dinner because that's healthy why would i change the way i eat mm -hmm. Well, we've been lied to. Mm -hmm. And in having this third party system where you have some suit on a tower mm -hmm. somewhere telling the practitioner what they can and cannot do, at that point, who is actually practicing medicine? Yeah. So when you're when you're fighting against red tape to get the care that you need, you know, uh, that's when it becomes really really frustrating for example like a very simple example uh hrt hormone replacement therapy you know um for people that need a little bit of testosterone testosterone is dirt cheap mm. bioidentical testosterone you can get like a five month supply for around 60 bucks mm. you know and because it's not necessary you know, uh, because um, as we age, our hormone levels are going to drop off. Um, the insurance companies don't want to shell out that money. And they make it super uber complicated mm. for patients to optimize their health. Mm. So, so we're fighting against sick care mm. where, you know, where someone is looking for that pill for that antibiotic for that you know rather than you know we've done all of this we are at a better health status what's the next thing that we can do to make us you know superhuman to make us feel like badasses you know and and insurance companies don't seem that don't look at that as being necessary so they'll do a couple of things they'll they'll first they'll say okay that's not medically necessary and then they'll have you fill out all this paperwork to do it. They'll have you do prior authorizations, meaning that, you know, and then they'll charge you a copay and they'll do something really funny. They'll make you go monthly for your prescription rather than giving you a vial that covers you for a couple of months because now you're paying every time you go in and now you're having to go through all these different, you know, uh, steps to prevent you from continuing the care. Mm -hmm. where you can avoid all of that by just paying cash. And, and it's the same thing with like labs, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many cool options for you to take care of your health and pay cash for your labs. Mm -hmm. And uh, insurance companies do different things, you know, like, for example, if you want a vitamin D level, you have to have a special code in there mm -hmm. for them to cover it. And if you don't have it, that's it. You are... That, that bill is yours, where a vitamin D level is pennies on the dollar. Mm. And it, especially with, you know, with what's going on in the world and, and, and the way that we are, you know, uh, not able to go outside us, uh, you know, as freely, you know, with the um, food infrastructure that we have and how little nutrition there is actually in food. You know, right now, minding our micro, micronutrients is just so damn important. Mm. And we should be able to, you know, it, we should be able to say to a person, what's your vitamin D level? And that person should be kind of like know where they were in the past six months. Yeah. <clears throat> I, yeah. So the, I think the primary difference for people to understand is that 
you know, our, our core medical system, our medical doctors is set up just, just to keep us one step above death. <laughs> it's well, not yeah. about, it's not about optimizing health. It's about keeping you alive enough and minimizing the expense that the insurance company has to pay for you. Um, and like you said, like, we want to clarify that, like, you know, if you need insurance, you need emergency care, like there's no better place to be than the United States. But if you're trying to be healthy and as well as possible, that's where I see that, you know, people like me helping people make long-term uh, habit change to their eating habits. And then somebody like you um, that can help with the fine tuning of all the other parts of optimizing your health as well. So I see it as, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, what's a good analogy of like, if you just want like, uh, something that's like the basics and get you around, but it's not going to be uh, fast and fun. You know, the basics of medical care is going to going to get you there. But if you well, actually you want know, to, it's like, you know, we saw a little bit of like a revolution with travel, mm. you know, in, you know, uh, in the eighties and nineties where, you know, people would go to a travel agency and then do, you know, do some negotiation with, within the travel agency but remember that the travel agency had to take a cut, you know, so, so mm -hmm. there is yeah. a little bit of a uh, profit margin that needs to be, and it's not a profit margin, but like cost saving, uh, uh, health cost uh, min minimization, you know, mm -hmm. right. with healthcare. And that's how they get through the ethics of making profits, you know, uh, with, with the health of people, you know, so it's a profit margin that they have mm -hmm. to keep. Uh, and and the internet pops up, and now people can go directly to the yeah. airline and buy directly without a middleman. So there is no other industry mm. where you would go to a restaurant and then have to you know pay someone else for for your menu, and then and then they bring you your food, and then you still owe some money for the service. <laughs> while you're continuing to pay someone else and you never know how much that meal cost. Yeah. And you can't actually get what you want. You have to get what somebody else says is the cheapest food okay you're allowed to get. To get. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like imagine if that was a restaurant, you know, you go to a restaurant and it's like, but I'm keto. And they're We're like, kind of seeing that with Uber Eats, right? Like that's a weird model now that like this other company's taking a cut and there's all these fees on top of it. And sometimes you get the food and it's soggy and not the thing you ordered. And <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it, it, you know, in, in that's, you know, that's no disruptor, you know, that's no disruptor as of it, you know, in, 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 you know, I'm old enough to have traveled and used taxis, you know, so you, you land on the airport and that's it. You are, you know, uh, completely, uh, you know, slave to whatever company they are using you know so so then you jump on that taxi you don't have any idea what their rates are mm. and you don't have any other options so then uber enters and they're like listen you know we're gonna have this competition you're gonna have a gps they're gonna pick you up you're gonna mm. know how much you're gonna pay before you get mm. there and once you get there originally you didn't even have to tip it was like no tipping Mm. So what happens, you know, they disrupt this model of taxis. And then last time I flew into Arizona, you know, I, ha I was in Los Angeles and I came back to Arizona. And I looked at my at my uh, Uber and like the price was tripled. Mm. So I actually went and took a taxi. And guess what happened with the taxi? They had a predetermined route, you know, they, they gave me how much it was going to be in advance. And so everyone is benefiting by disrupting the system, mm. you know, and, and being able to be a disruptor, especially in something as important as healthcare. Yeah. So, you know, I'm pretty proud of that. I, I, I don't know that's going to happen in my lifetime, but I would love to see that um, the population gets so healthy that we wake up and realize that most of the food that's being fed to us out there and marketed to us is destroying our health. And we that we all go, you know what? Never mind. Let's all eat really healthy. Um, and we get so healthy that we don't need these insurance companies that, that they have to switch. That they then, you know, they have to figure out, you know, all the big insurance companies that used to make money off of us staying moderately sick. Now they make money maybe from selling Fitbits or like encouraging yeah. us to have like 
stress management software and things like that that are just actually optimizing our health rather than just trying to maintain all these uh, medications that that they uh, have us on. And, and that's why I decided to go into this specific type of medicine. You know, I, I in, in, in even more, um, uh, you know, granular, you know, into naturopathic endocrinology, you know, so the, the, mm. the ability to modify hormones, because, you know, I see it as two gears. You have your lifestyle and then you have your physiology, okay? And what I see, it, I am not interested in, in, in helping people who just started in their journey, meaning mm. that, oh, you know, that they were eating a standard American diet and then they want to jump to me and, 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 you know, help them. No, we need health coaches. Mm. We need people to, I am not an expert on lifestyle. Mm. You know, I need people like you, Carol, to help me with lifestyle. You would be wasting your time asking me for, what should I eat for breakfast? <laughs> and I would say, I, I don't know, maybe a salad, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, you know, and, like, and, and then it's, it's, it's really crazy because I have no sweet tooth. So I'm very lucky about that. Like, I have Oh, sweet yeah. Tooth. I will tell you, I don't, I can even tell, I cannot tell the difference between like sugar and stevia. Oh, like, okay. Like there is no difference. It, to me, it's just sweet, you know? <laughs> so, so what I'm interested in is the people that put in the time that they've gone a healthy mm. lifestyle for mm. two or three months, okay? So they've done it, you know, the lifestyle is there. And nine times out of 10, lifestyle is there. Physiology just meshes with the gears and think magic happens. Sometimes mm. physiology is there. That, sorry, the lifestyle is there and the physiology isn't. Mm. And that's where I come in. That's where I investigate what is it about the physiology that is not actually working mm. and we optimize it so the lifestyles get better. Yeah. Very interesting though, because we see weight gain, we see obesity, we see you know weight gain as a disease, you know, mm. and, and and you know, tell me if I'm wrong. But the most difficult people to convince to change their lifestyle are those bastards that are skinny that are eating whatever the hell they want. You know? <laughs> because they're like, oh, I'm skinny, you know? Because they're the, gy the gym rats that were born with a six pack, right? <laughs> yeah. The problem is that I don't see weight gain as a disease. I see it as a symptom. I, I agree. Yeah. Some people will have that symptom. Some people will not. But the outcome is the same. There's yeah. going to be an increase in sickness and morbidity mm. if you don't ch change the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the first step, the first step in changing your lifestyle is to join a group, to, to, join, to have a health coach, to have accountability partners, to have people that can help you keep you honest and Nine times out of ten, that's gonna work. It's that ten percent that I'm mm. interested in that I can that I can really help them, you know, achieve those goals. Well, and that's such a good partnership then, because that's what I've been looking for. Is that there's a you know the basics bundle of of labs that I'm looking at, metabolic markers that I feel comfortable in interpreting and helping people with their lifestyle change adjust those. But once in a while, there was something that would crop up. That I'm like, I'm not an expert in this. You know, somebody's thyroid panel, ferritin, for example, the iron things. Uh, there's some things that I'm like, I don't, I'm not an expert in this area. I don't feel confident. I need that other person that I can help somebody go to this person, go to Dr. Ruiz now, and he's going to be able to help you dive in a little bit more than that. So for example, I had one of my uh, ladies that her iron labs, like I had her run the full panel and things were wonky. Like mm. one was high, one was low, one was this. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. We need somebody. Uh, I've referred her to you too. I'll, I'll re make sure she gets in touch with you again as well. That's the one that the only other person I had to refer to was, you know, $6,000 for a full package. It's like, I don't think she needs that much. Just some tweaking. Yeah. So you know, I'm, um, I'm gonna, I actually wrote an ebook about iron and the okay. Byron, so I'll send it to you and we, you, we can oh, make that's it great. Available. Yeah, we can make I, it available. Where I became, I didn't, in school, we didn't learn much about um, 
optimal lab ranges. Like we were, we, we were taught that there are those, like you should be aware that the standard lab ranges is not optimal, but we didn't get into really, you know, like functional medicine type of looking at those labs. Where I learned a little bit about ferritin and got my eyes open to that was through um, Dr. Mercola's book that he wrote. Um, it was kind of his keto book. He has a whole section in there about ferritin and how when it's too high, it's very pro-oxidant. You need to be wary of that. And I was like, okay. So that started to be something that I would uh, have my clients, um, especially if they were talking about like having fatigue, you know, that they didn't get that magical energy once they got into ketosis. Uh, okay. It's like time to dig in a little bit more and figure out something else is going on. So um, more, more interestingly, you know, more interestingly, you know, is that so there are, uh, there are certain situations where that ferritin becomes very important. For example, mm -hmm. Women that have low ferritin, very common and very underdiagnosed, okay? So, in fact, let's take one step back. You know, let's talk about anemia. What's anemia, okay? My favorite definition of anemia is anemia is the inability for your red blood cells to bring nutrients to your other cells, okay? So, you can get into a car accident, you start bleeding, you have anemia of blood loss because you don't have enough blood to bring those nutrients, you can have a B12 abnormality and you can have pernicious anemia. So now the B12 is not there to create healthy, you know, cells. Or you can have iron deficiency anemia, mm -hmm. iron being super necessary for life. Iron helps bind oxygen. And now imagine you have low levels of uh, iron. Now you're like literally asphyxiating while mm -hmm. breathing. Mm -hmm. okay? okay. So... Because of society, you know, uh, it's very funny. I, I was uh, I was in uh, Toronto and I went to this steakhouse with with Luis and Tyler, and we're sitting down and and I'm about to order a steak, okay. And I look at the steaks. It, all the steaks were between 900 1100 calories. Then I was looking at the salads, and those salads were like 13 to 1600 calories. <laughs> you know, and what do we you know what do we teach society in, so, mm -hmm. in the, oh no you don't order steak you're a, you're your girl you know yeah, yeah. and now you're eating more calories with less nutrition than if you had mm -hmm. ordered steak okay plus females have a period so now you're shedding a little bit of blood and if you have problems with insulin and you have pcos and you have you know things like that now you're going to be even more in it on the opposite side, guys, you know, we evolved to be hunter-gatherers. You know, we, we were supposed to go to war and we were supposed to, you know, get into uh, fights and, and get injured, you know. So guys have like the opposite. We tend to like hold on to iron really tightly. Mm -hmm. So when I see a guy that is anemic, my ears perk. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, there is a leak somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we need to find it and plug it because we can get into the same problems that, you know, conventional medicine gets. That's like, oh, you're anemic. Here's your iron. Yeah. You, like, well, let's replace it. But why are you bleeding as a guy? On yeah. The side, when I see a woman that has high levels of iron. Yes. Very pro-inflammatory. So one of the cool things that your body does, it's called um, anemia of chronic disease. Mm. Okay. And when you have anemia of chronic disease, you, the body grabs all those iron molecules and it stores it in ferritin. And the reason it does that is to put it away, hide it from bacteria and mm. viruses because the virus and bacteria use this to procreate. So then you are anemic because you're not utilizing your savings. And then there's still a infection. So if you were to treat a person with anemia of chronic disease with iron, you can have increases in levels of bacteria and your infection becomes worse. There, mm. uh, WHO has a paper about some, uh, uh, you know, good Samaritans that went to Africa and they were testing for iron deficiency on kids and they were giving them iron supplements and they were dying at a higher rate from malaria. Mm. Because their body, it was so wise that it was like, you know what? We're going to make ourselves anemic because it's going to keep us alive for longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
in, in, um, in while we deal with this malaria. So in that case, in a woman that has high levels of iron, we have to investigate why. So in, in you know, you can get into the thing where you know you just do um, uh, you know uh, uh, blood draws, you know, uh, uh, therapeutic phlebotomy. Yeah. But if there is if there is an infection, until you fix that infection, that's when those ferritin levels are going to be like, okay, we you know the infection is gone, and now you can rush that iron back into where it needs to be. Mm. Well, and also with the history of weight loss surgery as well, mm -hmm. where the intestinal tract has been modified, that's going to infect people have a much harder time absorbing all nutrients, all right? Nutrients. Yeah. In fact, you know, uh, if, if anyone that's listening has, you know, uh, has had uh, uh, stomach reduction surgery or lap band or whatever, uh, you know, one thing that you can do really easily is get bariatric specific vitamins. Mm. which they make and there's a couple of different ways of taking them there's liquid forms there's uh dissolvable ones because you're right you know shortening the digestion you know uh lowering the the digestive power is going to prevent you from absorbing things i have another friend um that um has been talking with me for years about how do I do keto? And it turns out that he's got a uh, decades long chronic fatigue and not in a like chronic fatigue syndrome, but just always he's felt like fatigued. And so I had a suspicion that he likely had iron overload mm. and same thing where it was like his physician wouldn't order that. And um, I finally had him just go get it yourself. Yeah. And yeah. the number came back at like seven or 800. And I was like, okay, here we go. This goes along with, you know, you need to, and then I said, you need to find a doctor that can deal with this for you because, um, and so he went to three different doctors and they all said, uh, I don't think, cause it, it also, I have suspicions that maybe that he has a uh, uh, familial hemochromatosis. Yeah. His father had just passed from um, Alzheimer's. And I know that that's, there's a correlation with that as well. And I said, this is really important that you go get this investigated and you get this checked out. But doctors would say, oh, well, the other numbers are fine. So I don't think that's what this is. Or you're just overweight right now. So just lose the weight. And and But they hadn't really investigated further to see that like this was something that this fatigue is something he'd had for decades. And it wasn't something that was just new with recent weight gain. And so um I, I gave up on trying to save him because I, I kept trying to say, and I've referred him to you as well to just get another uh, opinion because everybody else was telling him like ah that's nothing to worry about no big deal and um yeah so no, iron is very inflammatory iron literally oxidizes things iron yeah. is so necessary not just to bring oxygen to your cells but it is an integral part of your immune system and and we use iron to oxidize bacteria so mm -hmm. so yeah mm -hmm. it, interesting you know, the only thing that we fight now is our keyboards you know, uh, and and we're not shedding blood like we used to. We are not. We are not at a mismatch. You know, and it can be as simple, Carol, as just donating a little bit of blood. Mm -hmm. You know, donating a, a, a couple of pints of blood, keeping in mind not to go over the levels, and then see how you look, feel, and perform, like Rob would say. You know, and yeah. and it could be a very very simple fix. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk also about, um, just a little kind of defining metabolic optimization and mm -hmm. then, then also then get into the thyroid thing, which yes. I know you're really passionate about. So, um, so just kind of some basics of like, you know, what is metabolic dysregulation? What's metabolic optimization? You know, we can get in a lot of trouble with, with the way that we, we live our lives, you know, um, the, uh, the, the best the best theory, the best hypothesis for um, iron overload, uh, sorry, for uh, insul insulin resistance, mm. okay, for insulin resistance. The best hypothesis and something that I follow really closely is uh, the calorie in imbalance, you know, having mm. high levels of energy coming in. And every time you push a molecule of glucose into the cell, 
and goes into the mitochondria and does its thing. It creates reactive oxygen species. Okay, so it's like parking your car inside a garage and having it running. It's going to create a lot of CO2. And if you stay inside the car, you will die. So basically, when we're just pushing, 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 pushing the energy consumption, it is better for the cell to say, you know what, we're going to stop accepting insulin to stop creating those reactive oxygen species. So it's like turning off the car. And there are a lot of cellular models where they, you know, if you want to make cells in a lab insulin resistant, grab the Petri dish with the cells and you put, you ozone them. You put ozone and the ozone causes a lot of oxidative damage and then glucose won't go into the cell. It, it, insulin receptors get, you know, uh, uh, down, down regulated. For, there are, there is a study of people with high levels of iron that were type two diabetic. Mm. They gave them a chelating agent called the, the desferoxamine without any changes, without anything. As soon as those oxidative levels of iron went away, they stopped being insulin resistant. Mm. Okay. So there is, there is a component to oxidation. Okay. And if we lived in backwards world, where, you know, the pyramid looked very different, you know, and, um, and we were, you know, pushed to eat unlimited amounts of fat, you know, just like they pushed unlimited amounts of carbs. And then we had a very, very restrictive local, uh, low carbohydrate diet. And we, and all of these companies made this delicious, you know, full of preservative, you know, junk food, which we have some, you know, um, we would have something very similar, but instead of being insulin, we would be looking at different hormones. That's what my fear right now with this, most of the keto snack food products that are out there, they're not doing us any favors. No. Because no. they're just as tasty, you know, I, I don't know, arguably, you know, like let's say a keto version of a ding dong and a non-keto hostess version, like, Arguably, I don't even know that the keto version would be that much healthier. Maybe, well, maybe I'm just slightly less trigger overeating than the other version. But oh, leading to over, yeah, you know, I, I would rather my patients eat an apple than a keto donut. <laughs> you know, and, and it's like it's. It, I had a patient today. She was like, "Well, doc, I'm doing some, I'm doing a little bit of fruit. I'm having a, you know, some blueberries." And I'm like, "What? You know, like, why are you apologizing? You know." Uh, you know, now the problem is that even a little bit of fruit can be a trigger yeah, for other things, right? You know, it, it can definitely be a trigger, but I'm, you know, um, before I found out that I will, I had autoimmune thyroid disease, this is last year, uh, around, um, March, April, my weight just skyrocketed, mm. you know? I got up to, you know, 189 pounds and I was doing everything and anything that I know to do, you know, to lose the weight and it wouldn't budge. It just wouldn't budge. You know, I was, and, and, you know, I'm a doctor and, and I have to respect that. I, sometimes I see patients in, in, in face to face. So I had to be very, very careful, uh, with infections and stuff like that. You know, mm. so I can count in one hand how many times I went out to eat at a restaurant in 2020. I was mm. cooking all of my meals. I was, um, you know, everything organic, everything, you know, all of that, you know, and I kept gaining weight. So I started mm. doing OMAD. I started at one point, Carol, I was running laps around the parking lot and the, in, in the summer heat. I haven't done cardio <laughs> and, you know, in mm. six or seven years, you know, uh, and my weight wouldn't drop, you know? Mm. Um, so I ran some labs and I went to a doctor because a, a patient that treats himself, a doctor that treats himself has full for a patient, you know, and I, <laughs> and, I, and I had a lot of input. I got to admit, I had a lot of input on what, what, what it was doing. And yeah. My thyroid was broken. Mm. And then I realized, you know, when I was looking at my, at, at my, uh, trackers that I was eating too damn much. I mm. was, you know, um, I was eating 
one of the hobbies that I decided to pick up during during uh, the, this global pandemic was like I wanted to start getting into wine, you know. So I would go to Whole Foods and I would buy myself a ribeye steak or a New York strip. And I would make myself like a sweet potato, put some, you know, bacon and, and butter and some um, some uh, Brussels sprouts with foam broth, you know, all, you know, really, really healthy food. But that was clocking in around 2,600 calories for one meal. Oh, okay. <laughs> for one meal. And then I would open a bottle of wine. And that bottle of wine, you know, that one glass of wine turns into a bottle of wine, you know. And when I started quantifying what I was eating, I was like, damn, dude, you know, you can put a bunch of calories out, you know. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I, you know, Luis and Tyler kind of like, you know, uh, twisted my, my arm and I did a keto gains boot camp. And when I was trying to do my Sunday meal, okay, if I was, you know, if, if, if I wanted to have like a steak, uh, some Brussels sprouts, and you know, forget about the the, the sweet potato, you know, I kind of modified it, and I was eating a sirloin steak, which is way lower in fat. Mm. Forget about the, the the Brussels sprouts, you know, I would have had to eat seven Brussels sprouts to fit my macros. Seven, you know, who wants to eat seven? Yeah. Brussels, you know, yeah. <laughs> instead I switched that to a half. A head of cabbage and i don't know mm. if you've ever roasted a head of cabbage it's the most delicious hack i've ever you mm. know um you roast a half a head of cabbage a pound of sirloin you know and then you know some pickles or some uh some pickle jalapeno peppers or whatever i i was as full as eating that 3200 you know 2300 calorie uh, meal by eating 600 700 calories mm. you know so yeah, you know, uh, our ability to pack in a bunch of calories in a healthy meal is mm -hmm. exponential and it's going to continue that way. Now, hey, I love whiskey. I love wine. I love me a steak, you know, and I don't want to eat sirloin steak and half a cabbage for the rest of my life, mm. you know. So, but what am I doing? I am chunking my time and trying to keep at an appropriate weight level for me so I can have that bottle of wine every once in a while, you know, that, mm. that you know, from bourbon, you know, I, you know, I, I'm doing this, you know, because I enjoy life and I want to be there for my patients and for my family and for my friends. You know, I, I, I don't know if you've ever heard um, people come to you and say, you know, I just want to be off of all medication. Mm, yeah. I want to go of all medication, you know, no one is going to be on your deathbed and be like, you know, Carol, she never took a leave. You know, no one's going to say that. You know, like, what they're going to say is like, Carol helped thousands of people. She was, you know, I, I could call her at midnight and she was there for me. Mm. I could, you know, Carol had so much, you know, energy and she was so vibrant. And she, she was able to, you know, rescue kitties and, you know, kick <laughs> ass at the gym and, you know, you know, that's what people are going to rem uh, remember. So if it takes you taking a little bit of thyroid medication, taking, you know, some supplements, you know, doing periods of time where you restrict calories, where you restrict carbohydrates, when, when you are like super anal about you, you know, in order for you to have that vibrant life, in order to enjoy life, you know, like, why not do it? So what's, what's your sense then? So are you saying that you developed autoimmune uh, thyroid issues because you were overeating? Do you think that's the driver of it? Or what's, what, tell me about your, your theories, oh, my, your my take brain. on, you know, what, what, what causes thyroid disruption? Like what it makes it not work right? Cause I've got, so working with you, um, we're working on supporting my thyroid a little bit. So a little little bit of maybe some autoimmune thyroid, not sure exactly, but my cat, one of my cats who's 17 years old has hyperthyroidism, like he has too much thyroid. So it's interesting that both of us in the same household are experiencing <laughs> the opposite sides of that. So autoimmune thyroid disease has been pretty much um, uh, 
that you know it, it has been studied for a very long time and it it happens when your stress levels become so high that mm. your immune system goes kind of haywire and it starts attacking something that it shouldn't be attacking uh, the first case of autoimmune thyroid disease was um, recorded in France from a little girl who fell down the stairs, broke her back. Oh. Yeah. And then she became hyperthyroid. Okay. So hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism are basically the same disease, to, just two sides of the, of, of the coin. Um, why do we develop thyroid disease? We live in a very, very dirty environment. Mm. There is, you know, not only, you know, inflammation from all of the bad stuff that we eat, but we have, you know, lots of pollution in the air, mold, uh, heavy metals, you know, and then a genetic disposition, predisposition, mm -hmm. you know. So what ends up happening is that women usually, stop, you know, get diagnosed with autoimmune thyroid disease after the birth of their first kid. Hmm. So what is the most stressful time in a woman's life is usually, you know, if they decided to have babies, mm -hmm. it's usually going through, uh, you know, uh, uh, pregnancy and, and delivering mm -hmm. a baby. I, you know, I have asked as a, as a doctor, I'm a chronic hypochondriac, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> we, you know, in the healthcare field, you know, we are always looking at stuff, you know, and my, my mom, both of my sisters, you know, we have a long history of thyroid problems. Mm -hmm. So ever since I was in, in, in school, I, I, I've been checking my thyroid thinking, I'm go it's going to break, it's going to break, it's going to break. <laughs> so 2020 was my baby. You know, I didn't oh. lose my job. I, you know, I decided to open a new practice. You know, I'm a type A personality, adrenaline junkie. And the stress was enough for that change to happen. Mm. And, and sure enough, you know, as soon as I started taking the thyroid medication, I remember going into the living room and being like, there's something wrong. Like two o'clock in the afternoon and be like, there is something wrong. I'm just gonna lay down and close my eyes for a couple mm. of minutes. And then, you know, and then uh, just give me 20, you know, like that's not me. And as soon as that thyroid kicked in, man, you know, it's like all that energy that people talk about when they wake up, all that stuff, you know, started, you just like through the roof. Mm. The funniest thing, Carol, is that, you know, I am hyper aware of these things. For many years, my thyroid would test between 1.1, 1.3. I said on the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Thyroid stimulating hormone is a hormone that's produced in the brain that orders the thyroid to make more thyroid. So the higher that number is, the more hypothyroid you are, mm. okay? So my TSH was between 1.2, 1.3, 1.15. Guess when my thyroid broke? March One, of 2020. <laughs> it, was, it was probably, it clocked at in probably April or May at 1.2. Eight, nine. Okay. 1.89, which is well, well within the range. So oh, you're saying what what level was it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is which is really funny because I started dosing, you know, with the thyroid medication. And uh, I started, you know, with a so I so I thought to myself, okay, 1.18 1 to 1.15, I probably just need a baby dose of thyroid. So I started with a quarter grain of thyroid, checked my levels, and my levels actually went up. So my theory was that my brain was like, holy shit, it's working. You know, finally <laughs> you're listening to me. <laughs> or, you know. So then I went to half a grain, three quarters of a grain. And once I hit 60 milligrams or, or, or one grain of uh, natural desiccated thyroid, my thyroid right now is like about 0 0.97, 0 0.8. You know, but it, it was it was insane that a lot of people think that, oh, the higher the number, the more thyroid you need. Not mm. necessarily, not necessarily. Mm. Fine tuning and adjusting. Yeah. OK, well, that makes sense then, because um, last year was stressful for a lot of people. Um, 
not only was there a global pandemic, but I also chose to pick up and move living yeah. in the Northwest for almost 50 years of my life and then moving down to the, the desert and a um, lot of uh, stressors. And then I had one more move. I moved to another place uh, about three months ago as well. So that kind of correlates with, um, uh, with, with my issues cropping up. up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. It, it, what sucks is that, you know, our bodies are resilient. Mm -hmm. You know, our bodies are resilient. So you probably have had a need for thyroid that was mm -hmm. not overt. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you probably had a need for thyroid that didn't appear as a highlighted thing on your labs mm -hmm. for a long time. So seeing those numbers, seeing those numbers, uh, as you know, in a functional way mm -hmm. makes a whole lot of difference in how fast we can diagnose mm -hmm. an autoimmune disorder. You know, um, and then there's other things that show up, you know, so what, what is the thyroid? You know, I'm not sure how much time we have, but I can talk forever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what, what does the thyroid do? The thyroid, uh, it, it, you know, it's basically your metabolism. It helps with your metabolism. It, it makes your you, things work. Mm. Uh, the reason why people lose their hair is because thyroid, unlike insulin, thyroid hits every cell in your body. Mm. And, so, you know, we, we have some passive receptors in, in our brain for, for sugar where you don't need insulin to activate it. Mm. But thyroid hits every cell in your body. Mm. So imagine if you're going hypothyroid, what is your body doing? You know, and eh, do we really need hair? What's more important, you know, to have, <laughs> you know, to continue breathing and your brain working? Do we really need hair? So it starts shutting down mm -hmm. things systemically. You know, non non um, uh, uh, important things go first. You know, and that's why we start being really cold. We start, you know, um, uh, losing our hair, um, and then your thyroid starts to grow because mm -hmm. your your brain is yelling at your thyroid so much that your thyroid is like, I don't know what to do, dude. I can't make any more. So let's start growing, get more surface area, and try to meet demand. And that's when we can start having cysts, nodules, and problems where, you know, those could develop into thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. So early detection with antibodies and an ultrasound is so important to prevent that. Mm -hmm. You know, so one thing, you know, so, so again, you know, the thyroid is, um, uh, the thyroid is trying to, to break down things, you know, and one problem that I see a lot with my keto people is cholesterol. Mm. Sometimes cholesterol goes really, really high. And I have a lot of tolerance for cholesterol. You know, we know that uh, cholesterol levels, uh, you know, have a U curve. Can I share my screen? Um, I Well, let me, I've, uh, if it lets you, sure. Let me see. Do I have to do anything? I don't know. I think, let me see. I don't know if, let's see, edit mic settings. I think I only have the option to do that. I don't know. Oh, oh, here we go. Look at that. Teaching me tricks here. <laughs> okay. So, so I have this, you know, this patient come to me, you know, um, and, uh, and he, he was, uh, lost a bunch of weight, changed his lifestyle, was feeling like a badass, you know, and 60 year old dude. And, uh, and like, this is his, his change, you know? Wow. Yeah. And his doctor tells him, uh, you, your cholesterol is high. I don't care if you have more energy. I don't care if you have a six pack. Mm. He's my spirit animal. I want to be like him, you know? Uh, yeah. You need to change what you're doing because your cholesterol, you're going to die of a heart attack, mm. you know? So, um, these are his labs and they're very small. So I'm going to read them, you know? Uh, eh, maybe they can. There you go. So check this out. So his his liver function was high. You know, his cholesterol was two twenty four. Oh, which and they were freaking out, telling him. Yeah, no, that that looks good to me. <laughs> yeah, telling him to go back. Look at his triglycerides. Look at his yeah. HDL. Yeah. Okay. So he, you know, 
Um, I want to show that there is there is a U curve with cholesterol. Well, okay. and, and if I can share a little story of when I was in when I was in school and uh, whatever class it was where we're learning about cholesterol levels and recommendations and the correlation with you know mortality more uh, basically mortality. And there was a bell curve there, yep. and it showed that you know if somebody's total cholesterol was 180, the same risk as it. At, my hands are off here, but at, at 220, yep. right? And this was, at, this was at the time, yeah, this was at the time where like they just arbitrarily at that time had said 200 was the cutoff. If your total cholesterol now they've moved on to just focusing on LDL, but this was the time when they were just focused on total cholesterol, and so uh, they they said you know total cholesterol above 200 problem. And so I raised my hand and asked my professor, I'm like, wait a minute, what? why did they pick that number when you actually have a lower risk at 220 than you did at 200? And and she said, well, it was just a nice round off number, easy to remember. And I'm like, this is <laughs> blowing my mind yeah. that it's not even about health. It's not even about optimal health. It's just, we got to draw the line somewhere. So let's just pick a number that's easy to remember. And, and this is this is exactly what what is showing right here. You know, if you go below 180, yeah, you have a higher risk of all death, all cause mortality. Okay. Yeah. You know? And if you go, you know, and and but but this is the thing, Carol. If you go above 300, you start losing, you start losing the benefits. Mm. You know, so we have to be, you know, and, and that's where our bias can bite us in the ass, you know. So, so there are there are a couple of people that say, oh no, it's a, a, a cholesterol hybrid, you know, lean mass hyper responder. You know, no. At some point, we have to make sure that we are taking care of our patients, you know, because sometimes that can be a problem. So, you know, we were looking at his numbers, you know, and I found out that his thyroid was at a 3.5 oh wow yeah and his microsomal antibodies you know oh yeah 33 now check this out less than 60 is okay and, <laughs> that's and what I, the lab says yeah. yeah and i'm like okay so you're you're in your castle and you have yeah. 33 people outside attacking your castle are you gonna be like you know what no let's wait until 60 get here yeah <laughs> And once 60 get here, we'll do something about it. No, let's do something about it about it now. And now these are his levels. His liver functions are better, you know. His cholesterol is too low now. Wow, yeah. Yeah. But look at his triglycerides. His okay. HDL is beautiful. VLDL is beautiful. Interesting. And his thyroid is perfect now. So so basically, you know. We'll be very curious then to see how mine does because um, tended towards, you know, high cholesterol my whole life, but I was like, you know, pre-keto metabolic syndrome, definitely had metabolic syndrome. Um, you know, my total was between like 220 to 240, Which is um, but that was, that was mostly like high triglycerides. They're probably, I think my triglycerides were like 220 yeah. uh, and you know, HDL has always been very low for me, like 32, 34. Mm. Um, and, you know, so the picture of metabolic dysregulation, right? Yeah. And um, so uh, going keto, more more of my personal story here about, uh, I'm trying to remember how far I was in. Maybe I was, um, I was working some um, health events where we had access to the little cholesterol measures and um, I had been weight stable at this point for six six months. So I lost 60 pounds, feeling the best I'd ever had. And um, one of my co-health advisor people, like, you know, we're working this event. And I was like, hey, you know, let's sneak over and check. Let's check my cholesterol. Like, let's see that, you know, I haven't checked any of my numbers or anything. And, um, and again, this was weight stable because they say you want to, like, check it. Actually, actually, I don't think I had been now that I think about it because I thought uh, – I was like, okay, maybe it's just because I'm still in, in uh, it has been six months of being weight stable. But my number, like that check I got was like, my total was like 400 something. My LDL was like 380. Um, my HDL was, uh, you know, still less than 50. And I was just like, oh my God, what happened here? Uh, and I was in shock. And 
but I felt the best I'd ever felt. So I was just like, I don't know what to do with this information. Yeah. Um, and it's calmed down much uh, since then, but I still don't fit into like the optimal range. Um, and really the last um, lab, so, you know, me following low carb, mostly keto for six and a half years now, um, my HDL has come up to 55, the highest it's ever been my whole life, uh, which I think is good. And my, my triglycerides tend to be, you know, you know, 90 to 100. And, uh, but my LDL still runs much higher than what, um, you know, the doctors would say, you know, yeah. like, so my total is somewhere in the, th you know, 300s. And so I'll be very curious to see with this yeah. thyroid medication coming on board, what my, um, what my cholesterol panel starts to well, look like. So. And, 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 you know, a couple of things, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you've noticed I'm Mexican uh, and, and, you know, it, people from the equator, people that have ancestrally more access to carbohydrates mm. have less access to saturated fats. Okay. So I tend to hold on really tightly to saturated fats. So if I do a ketogenic diet, which I do, you know, and I do things like um, uh, coconut oil, lard, things like that, my lipids go up. But if I switch my saturated fats or monounsaturated fats, meaning instead of cooking with coconut oil, I use avocado oil or olive mm. oil. I use my butter. Butter increases your lipids uh, more than any, like almost any, any other food stuff. Um, if I use uh, uh, butter, I use butter as a, like almost like a seasoning, meaning mm. like I'll take some collard greens, put it on the plate, and then I'll put a dab of butter and eat, you know, as a seasoning, not mm -hmm. as the main cooking, you know, oil. And just modifying the saturated fats that I add, the added saturated fats, I really don't worry about meat. I really don't worry about like chicken thighs or things like that. Just the added saturated fats helps me keep my lipids around 201, 206. Yeah, that, that little change. But yeah, no, my lipids can go sky high if I start using coconut oil. That if I start using my main cooking, you know, uh, uh, use saturated fats. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, primarily European descent, so. Um, yeah. It yeah, would be, it, it would be a cool experiment, you know, because well, one, like, th one, th one thing at a time, we'll see what the thyroid modifies. Yeah, uh, no, modif no, no. I bet, I bet the thyroid is going to drop those numbers, you know, yeah. but it would be a cool experiment because in reality, it's not that hard, you know, like it, it's not mm. something as like leading carbohydrates. That's difficult, you know, but like instead of buying coconut oil, buying avocado oil, that there's no flavor in it and it's a very easy switch. Mm. Yeah. My, I love uh, bariani olive oil. I don't know if you've tried that or not, but no, oh, you know, Ooh. yeah, so Ooh, fresh, olive oil. fresh from Italy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, olive oil, monounsaturated fatty acids. You know, th that's going to be very, very helpful. Yeah. yeah. So one, one last question for you. Uh, you threw this idea out to me, which has my head uh, spinning, and I've been chatting with my my clients about this. But um, your take, your position for women is that they shouldn't really do intermittent fasting and that they should be eating three meals a day. Uh, so talk to me about that. What's your experience with um, oh, your man. patient clients with that? That's a, that's a really awesome thing. You know, that, that, that's a really awesome topic, you know, especially talking to a female health enthusiast, you know, because it just so happens that a lot of the people that are putting these ideas out are guys, mm. you know, so you have some guy telling you, I, I personally do intermittent fasting. I do a lot of intermittent fasting. You know, uh, I, it makes me so much more efficient. You know, I don't have to stop and eat. Mm -hmm. so, and I, I personally have just, I've never been hungry in the morning. I yeah. prefer, so I've just, usually my first meal is in the afternoon. I just wait until I'm hungry to eat and then, I eat and that's what I've been directing all my clients to do as well is to not force yourself to eat. I find that if I eat first thing in the morning that I'm hungrier the rest of the day, but I also know that that's a sign that your metabolic rate is increased is if you're hungry. Yep. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I come from a family of people. My mom, for example, like never ate breakfast, almost never ate lunch. She always just ate w one giant meal at the end of the day. Um, I remember growing up and telling her like, that's so bad for you. You got to eat six times a day. You know, I came through that, that uh, time that, of health and cool. stuff. So yeah. And, and I love OMAD and I've done OMAD a whole bunch of times. And the first thing that I do when my adrenal function is falling mm. is I have breakfast. That is the first thing that like, like, for example, if I'm waking up in the middle of the night and I'm using the bathroom, if I feel like fatigue, you know, if I know that I'm going to be under a, a, a lot of pressure, the first stressor that I remove is intermittent fasting. Mm. Two types of stressors. Do you know the salt before bed trick for uh, the waking up in the middle of the night? So, yeah. So that's going to maintain, you know, the levels of aldosterone a little bit lower, you know, and it's going to prevent you. But it, I, another trick that is, you know, that, that works is, you know, you don't even have to do salt. You can do a little bit of carbohydrates, you know. Mm. Like, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so that's the thing, you know, you are gaming the system. I've done, I've done the carbs before bed my whole life. That didn't do me any favors. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when you're stressed, you know, you're going to release cortisol. Okay. So cortisol mm -hmm. is released, you release glucose, and then that's going to retain water and that water needs to, you know, end up somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the idea is to get carbohydrates, get salt, prevent the stimulation of the adrenal glands. So now you're not releasing, you know, uh, the, the hormone that is going to retain water and now you don't pee. Okay. So thought experiment, or I'm going to ask you a couple <laughs> of questions. Um, yeah, yeah. How many calories does it take? Well, you know, before we do that. Okay. So uh, the, let's see if we agree on this. Like the healthiest a human being can be is when they are fertile. When they are fertile. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. 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 So being an able. Oh, I'm, I'm downhill. I'm going, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have HRT we can do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when, so, so the body is going to do anything and everything to prevent, you know, to, to, you know, like our, our lizard brain, we just want to procreate, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's why we have this innate want for calories and that's why mm -hmm. we bypass things and you know and we can eat and eat and eat and eat and you know and, and whatever you know okay how many calories does it take for a guy to produce one load of ejaculate oh just oh i mean i don't know the exact <laughs> question is like <laughs> just, just everything it takes to metabolically created or just how yeah. many calories equivalent just is to, that just to metabolically have the the, the oh. savings you know in order to be able to procreate i don't know 2500 calories i'm just gonna <laughs> 140 140 okay okay calories, 140 okay. calories you know and that's it you know 140 calories you can procreate okay okay how many calories does it take for a woman to create a baby oh my gosh well let's see I know, I know back from uh, school, it was like 250 calories a day in your first first and second trimester and then 500 there, or is it 250 a day average for the whole pregnancy and then 500 a day for uh, lactation? I can't remember the exact numbers, but a lot. <laughs> 75,000 calories. Okay. Which equal, so, so 75,000 calories, if you, if you do, um, uh, you know, over nine months, it's around 150 extra calories per day. So that okay. so now, no, so that's 150 extra calories per day. That doesn't mean that's going to give you all the calories you need for your own mm. things. You know. So what the reason I'm bringing this 150 calories a day is because that conception, that that preconception of oh, you got to eat for two. No, mm, right. <laughs> you, know, you don't need to eat 4,000 calories a day. You know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so women have a smaller trigger. Okay. Or hormone dysregulation from mm. calorie restriction. Okay. Where guys, if you skip one meal, you're going to make up 140 calories by lunch and dinner. And women are going to be, you skip one meal, your pituitary is already freaking out. Oh my mm -hmm. goodness. You know, oh my goodness. And it stops 
it starts the making you tired by diminishing mm -hmm. the amount of metabolic things that is going to produce. Now, okay, what does that mean practically? What does that mean practically? Does it mean that no woman should use, you know, uh, intermittent fasting? No. Intermittent fasting is a really cool way of reducing calorie intake because mm -hmm. you're skipping one meal. Mm -hmm. The thing is that you have to work with someone that knows their shit to tell you exactly how many calories you need in a day. So if you do calorie restriction with appropriate nutrition, cram, mm -hmm. calorie restriction with appropriate nutrition, where you are eating enough calories in a day to satisfy those physiological things, you're going to be okay. Additionally, another hack that you can do is that you really don't need that many calories. So avoiding, you know, doing intermittent fasting uh, doesn't mean that you need, that, that you're going to do zero calories. In fact, mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, you know, I don't know how many people are going to be pissed off at me from say, for the saying this, but intermittent fasting is not like, oh my goodness, I just tasted a little bit of cream. I'm out of the fasting state. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, it, it, it's a gradient. In fact, yeah. Dr. Walter Longo has a product where you eat all day and you are doing intermittent fasting, you know? Well, in the, uh, the, don't, I, yeah, don't, no. don't bring up the fast bar. That's a whole lie. But anyway, well, listen, <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, I've done it. He sent me a box um, very early on and I was hungry the whole day because I yeah, would yeah. rather <laughs> not eat. Yeah. I would rather not eat. That you know, once I have something, I'm forget about it. You know. Yeah, I'm the so, same way. Yeah. But the thing, what I'm trying to say is this: you know, it can be as easy as okay, doing like a protein shake in the morning. You know, getting 25 grams of protein in the morning, mm -hmm. you will not completely shut down the um, the all of the benefits from fasting, and you will support your hormonal health. Mm -hmm. Now. If you have hormonal problems, you should work to get those hormones to where they need to be. So then you can earn the ability to do <laughs> calorie restriction with appropriate nutrition. You know? So, more, so you're saying, I've never heard this crayon thing. Love it. Yeah. Um, so is it more, is, is it kind of like along the lines of like what Marty Kendall's doing with his like nutrient optimization? So really focusing, focusing yeah. on nutrient dense foods. In, 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 in the sweet spot, Carol, you know, is, is you, know, uh, you know, for hormonal health, you know, because uh, let's, be, let's be honest about it. You know, if you want to lose weight, you, at some point you have to cut calories. Yeah. yeah. It, it, for, you know, to protect that hormonal health, you know, being around 60 and 75 grams of fat uh, in a day, you know, that, that helps you. Because remember, hormones have a backbone of cholesterol, you know? So, so like, for example, if you were doing intermittent fasting and you're doing it on, on, on like a high carbohydrate diet where you don't have enough fat, your hormones will suffer more than mm. if you were doing a, an appropriate calorie restriction with enough cholesterol and enough fat to help you maintain your hormonal levels, mm. you know? And so, so there's two types of stressors in this world. You know, you, traffic is a stressor you cannot control, you know, deadlines, your job, you know, those are things that you cannot control. There are stressors that you can control. For example, mm -hmm. exercise, fasting, you know, those are things that when I am getting super stressed, those are the first things that I am going to start cutting back and kind of like easing up on. But what we hear is, oh my God, I'm so stressed out. I'm going to eat that Ben and Jerry's. And now you're, right, right. <laughs> you're admitting that you're super stressed and now you're adding more junk, which is going to stress your body even more. Mm -hmm. The more stressed we are, the less leeway that we have for this hormetic stressors. Mm. So someone that is metabolically 
the range or, or has hormonal problems or it's going to have less of an ability to have that intermittent fasting, but you can earn it if you're sleeping well, mm. if you're eating really healthy food, if your hormones are better, then you can earn that ability. So what happens is that all these guys who we can fast like nothing, we get on social media and we talk about fasting and then women do it. They fail at it because physiology and then they double down and they go, you know what? Fasting, you know, 14 hours didn't work. I'm going to go 16. You know what? I'm going to do 18. I'm going to, you know, and then they get deeper and deeper in the hole. And that's why I am so happy and so proud to have met you because we need more women in healthcare mm -hmm. because 90% of the people that I see are women and they should be, you know, listened and we should be able to take care of women by women, you know, uh, because it's going to be completely different than what works for me. Yeah. Well, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, amazing. I should make a little, I'm going to make a little banner here really quickly so that people know where to go. Is it okay if you, if I send you some more people? Oh my goodness. Yeah. You, you send them. Okay. So, uh, here we go. And most importantly, you know, uh, it, yeah, in, in, in uh, the, the, the best thing, you know, you can do is uh, just send an email to M-E-G-A-N dot M-A-C-K, Megan dot Mac at, at gohealth.com and tell them, you know, I, I'm, we're going to do, you know, um, a special rate for people that you, you send us, you know, people are, that are part of your program. So you know, Megan, Megan, what was the... Megan at, at Megan.mac. Say that, what? <laughs> Megan, Megan, period, M A C K at, at gohealth.com. M A, oops, A C K. Okay. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah, just, just is that send, right? Did I spell it right? Beautiful. Okay. Well, that's it. Just send an email. You know, um, uh, before I do anything, I, I do like to sit with perspective patients for 15 minutes for a couple yeah. of reasons you know that's, let's this, make... that's this one here at gohealth.com for okay yeah. but you'll take care of that for <laughs> yeah and uh i like to sit with them and you know i like to do a free 15 minute consultation to see if we are you know a lot of times i go you know what now we go talk to carol you know I, I i'm not a nutritionist you know i'm not you know i i'm you would be wasting your time you know like it why don't you do her program first see what gets better and then and then uh and then if that doesn't get fixed then you can come to me you know but uh but i'm i'm gonna give them a special rate uh you know for people that are part of your program yeah excellent excellent well thank you so much for everything like you said we i'm sure we could talk all night long uh i'm supposed to go meet my meet, meet my friends for uh so for dinner they they just don't understand this 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 uh, you know lifestyle change thing. Unfortunately, both of them are on various medications. They just think like, no, I, I have to be on a, on on a lip uh, statin. That's because I, I have a statin deficiency. That's why yeah. I need to be on those. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it, it, the only thing we can do for our friends and family is be an example. Yeah, yeah. We we talk about anything but nutrition. I I'm off the clock when I'm hanging out with my friends and. <laughs> Yeah, we can be an example, and when and and you know, and when they see the light, when they see when we shine, they'll see it, and that's when they'll, on yeah. their own accord, they'll be like, help me, you know. Well, thank you so much for everything you've shared. So much good stuff. Uh, so thankful that I've uh, met you and have to be able to share you with the world too. So. Uh, uh, let, you know, let let uh, uh, remember, we're gonna give you that uh, iron deficiency iron book. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, so I'll, I'll email that to you and then uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah. I'll wrap. Let me close up this uh, broadcast. Thank you everyone for watching. We'll see you all next time. Bye.